Knowledge Products presents The Giants of Philosophy, David Hume, narrated by Charlton Heston. Part 1. Between 1739 and 1754, David Hume published a series of philosophical and political works destined to form a turning point in the history of Western thought. But he gained public recognition as a writer only later in life, and even then it was for his more popular essays on social and economic topics. The more theoretical works needed more than a century to be widely accepted. David Hume was keenly aware of his own destiny. He also had the good sense to recognize his vanity, his desire to be accepted as a great stylist in the Republic of Letters. He begins his own autobiography with such a candid admission. It is difficult for a man to speak long of himself without vanity. Therefore, I shall be short. It may be thought an instance of vanity that I pretend at all to write my life. But this narrative shall contain little more than the history of my writings, as indeed almost all my life has been spent in literary pursuits and occupations. The first success of most of my writings was not such as to be an object to vanity. In the beginning, it didn't look as if Hume's literary career had much of a chance. I was born the 26th of April, 1711, at Edinburgh. My father's family is a branch of the Earl of Holmes, or Hume's, and my ancestors had been proprietors of the estate for several generations. My father died when I was an infant, leaving me with an elder brother and a sister under the care of our mother, who, though young and handsome, devoted herself entirely to the rearing and education of her children. Hume had a serious and scholarly disposition, so he was sent to the University of Edinburgh to study law. There he discovered that literature would be the ruling passion of his life. I found an unsurmountable aversion to everything but the pursuits of philosophy and general learning. And while my family fancied I was poring over the law, Cicero and Virgil were the authors which I was secretly devouring. David Hume was a lowland Scot who never lost his Scottish accent. He constantly strove to eliminate Scottish phrases from his writing, even going so far as to compile and publish a list of such expressions. He also accepted the union of Scotland with England and saw the future of his land as part of a larger whole. Hume was always sensitive to his origins. He eventually would return to them, but he strove as a writer to develop a style that would appeal to a cosmopolitan audience. After leaving the University of Edinburgh, financial pressures forced Hume to get a job with a merchant in Bristol. But the business world didn't suit him. Resolving to live as frugally as possible, Hume made his way to the town of La Fleche in France. La Fleche was already famous because the great 17th century French philosopher René Descartes had gone to school there. I there laid that plan of life which I have steadily and successfully pursued. I resolved to make a very rigid frugality supply my deficiency of fortune to maintain unimpaired my independence, and to regard every object as contemptible except the improvement of my talents in literature. At La Flesh, Hume spent three years writing his Treatise of Human Nature. This work was destined to become one of the greatest works of philosophy written in the English language. Hume returned to Great Britain and published the treatise in 1739, before he was 27 years old. The world's response was deeply disappointing. No literary attempt was more unfortunate than my treatise of human nature. It fell dead-born from the press, without reaching such distinction as even to excite a murmur among the zealots. This was only the first of many disappointments for Hume as an author. How was he able to bear up under the lack of attention? I am a man of mild dispositions, of command of temper, of an open, social, and cheerful humor, capable of attachment, but little susceptible of enmity, and of great moderation in all my passions. Even my love of literary fame, my ruling passion, never soured my humor, notwithstanding my frequent disappointments. Hume wasn't content to concede to the public's indifference. 
he had the audacity to publish an unsigned review of his own book. This review, now known as the Abstract, is an invaluable guide to understanding the treatise. In the Abstract, Hume underscores both the revolutionary subject of his work and the unique nature of his approach to philosophy. According to Hume, creative human intelligence is the foundation of all the sciences. If we can understand the nature of human beings, we'll understand the foundation of all the other sciences. Our understanding of ourselves is more fundamental than our understanding of the world. The science of man is the most basic of all forms of knowledge. Until we understand mankind, we can't fully comprehend anything else. Hume's suggesting a radical reorientation in thinking, a, a radical reorientation in modern philosophy. His emphasis is on mankind and how we approach the world rather than upon the world itself. Other modern philosophers, such as Leibniz, Descartes, and Locke, had tried to supply a theory of human nature. But Hume claims they'd all failed. They'd treated human beings as solitary thinkers concerned with purely theoretical tasks. But Hume claims that human beings are social beings confronted with primarily practical tasks. He says we need a philosophy that recognizes the fundamental importance of action. Our philosophy must be based upon those other measures of evidence on which life and action entirely depend, and which are our guides even in most of our philosophical speculations. Hume turned briefly to a life of action. In 1745, at age 34, he became a tutor to a young, slightly demented nobleman. In 1746, he became a soldier and secretary to a General Sinclair. In 1748, he traveled with Sinclair to Vienna and Turin as a minor diplomat. Having achieved a small degree of financial independence, Hume returned to his career of writing. But his first book had failed, and he blamed it on financial problems which forced him to rush the book into publication. I had always entertained a notion that my want of success in publishing the treatise of human nature had proceeded more from the manner than the matter, and that I had been guilty of a very usual indiscretion in going to the press too early. Hume revamped the treatise and published two parts of it under new titles, calling them respectively An Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding, published in 1748, and An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals, published in 1751. In the so-called First Inquiry, the Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding, Hume reaffirmed the fundamental reorientation he wanted to give to philosophy. Indulge your passion for science, but let your science be human, and such as may have a direct reference to action and society. Be a philosopher, but amidst all your philosophy, be still a man. The inquiries met with as little success as the publication of the treatise. My inquiry concerning the principles of morals, which in my own opinion, who ought not to judge on that subject, is of all my writings, historical, philosophical or literary, incomparably the best. It came unnoticed and unobserved into the world. <laughs> In 1751, Hume had his first real success with the publication of his political essays. From this point on, he became the first British philosopher to support himself from his writings. In 1752, at the age of 41, he accepted an invitation to become the librarian of the Faculty of Advocates in Edinburgh, a legal library. While he was the custodian of such a large library, he started writing A History of England. The four volumes of this work were published between 1754 and 1761, but Hume's history was curiously published because it was written backwards. The first volume covered the period from 1603 to 1649, and the second volume covered the period from 1649 to 89. But the third volume covered the period from 1489 to 1603, and the fourth volume covered the period from 55 B.C. to 1485. Hume's history didn't just retell a familiar tale. On the contrary, it attempted to deal with a serious political controversy of his day. 
In the previous century, the British Parliament had executed one king, Charles I, in 1649. It had endured the near dictatorship of Cromwell, the Puritan leader, and it had restored the monarchy under Charles II, only to drive him from the throne in 1688. The Parliament then had replaced the ruling House of Stuart with William and Mary of Orange, and finally with the German House of Hanover under George I. As these political events occurred, the social and political life of Britain was radically transformed. The debate over the transformation continued throughout Hume's lifetime. Hume's history tried to mediate the conflict between those for and those against revolution. The revolutionists, known as Whigs, thought that violent revolution could be justified in principle. Anti-revolutionists, known as Tories, believed that unless there was respect for authority, no society could achieve stability, including any created by the revolutionaries. In beginning with recent history, Hume was focusing on the current question of whether citizens owed loyalty to the succession, to the new ruling house of Hanover. In working his way backward, Hume sought to justify his interpretation by showing how later events evolved from earlier ones. As expected with those who mediate a dispute between passionately committed factions, Hume was attacked by both sides, Whigs and Tories. The Whigs were offended by the first volume, the Tories by the second. Nevertheless, the controversy brought Hume some attention, and the history was his first success, both financially and as a work of literature. Hume's history was translated into French. In reviewing the first volume, the great Voltaire himself praised Hume for his fairness. Nothing can be added to the fame of this history, perhaps the best ever written in any language. Mr. Hume, in his history, is neither parliamentarian, nor royalist, nor Anglican, nor Presbyterian. He is simply judicial. In 1763, Hume again accepted a diplomatic post, this time as secretary to Britain's embassy in Paris. Soon he began visiting the great literary salons of Paris. He was fated as Le Bon David, despite speaking French with an atrocious Scots accent. He was invited to meet the Dauphin, the successor to the French throne, and the Dauphin's three sons, each one of whom was to become a king. Hume finally had achieved the renown he'd sought. He discovered that the French thinkers Orbach, Voltaire, Diderot, Montesquieu, and many others had read and admired not only his history, but his works on religion, economics, and politics. Hume attended a dinner party at the home of Baron Dolbach, where he proclaimed in front of a dozen eminent French thinkers that he had never met an atheist. The Baron then informed Hume that he was currently dining with 12 such people. Despite such embarrassments, Hume loved being in Paris. You will never imagine the reception I met with at Paris, from men and women of all ranks and stations. The more I recoiled from their excessive civilities, the more I was loaded with them. There is, however, a real satisfaction in living at Paris from the great number of sensible, knowing, and polite company with which the city abounds above all places in the universe. I thought once of settling there for life. Hume left Paris in 1766. He'd befriended the highly controversial writer Jean-Jacques Rousseau and persuaded Rousseau to return with him to England. Rousseau was at that time a fugitive because he'd recently published a novel, Emile, and another work entitled Social Contract. His temperament was totally different from Hume's. Hume, by now, weighing close to 300 pounds, was trusting and infinitely good-natured. Rousseau was a small man, almost paranoid in his suspicions of others. Rousseau candidly commented on the differences between himself and Hume. Mr. Hume is the truest philosopher that I know, and the only historian that has ever written with impartiality. He has not loved truth more than I have, I venture to believe, but I have sometimes put passion into my researches, and he has put into his only wisdom and genius. Pride has often led me astray by my aversion for what was evil or what seemed so to me. I have hated despotism in the Republican and intolerance in the theist. Mr. Hume has said 
here is what makes intolerance and here is what makes despotism he has seen from all points of view what passion has let me see only from one he has measured and calculated the errors of men while remaining above their weaknesses despite vast differences of temperament and style Hume and Rousseau agreed on one thing theoretical reason alone can't explain the social world and it can't solve all human problems passion not reason is fundamental to human beings the social world is held together by sentiment and tradition so Hume and Rousseau both differed from the prevailing view of their age of enlightenment which placed all of its faith in reason Hume found a quiet house in the country with servants and board where Rousseau could work. He even got Rousseau a pension from King George III. But Rousseau's suspicious mind came to believe that Hume was part of an insidious international plot to destroy him and his work. They quarreled, and finally their friendship broke in 1766. Throughout his career, Hume was severely criticized by his philosophical opponents. The Reverend Thomas Reed, professor of philosophy at King's College, Aberdeen, was one such critic. In 1764, Reed published a lengthy attack on Hume called An Inquiry into the Grounds and Nature of the Several Species of Ratiocination. I never thought of calling in question the principles commonly received with regard to the human understanding until the Treatise of Human Nature was published in the year 1739. The ingenious author of that treatise upon the principles of Locke, who was no skeptic, hath built a system of skepticism which leaves no ground to believe any one thing rather than its contrary. Then, in the introduction to his book, Reed ridicules Hume's intentions. It seems to be a peculiar strain of humor in David Hume to set out in his introduction to the treatise by promising with a grave face no less than a complete system of the sciences upon a foundation entirely new to wit that of human nature when the intention of the whole work is to show that there is neither human nature nor science in the world Hume wanted a serene life but he continued to work on the burning issues of the day he criticized English extremists who threatened the fabric of English liberty. He also spoke out against Britain's religious zealots. Hume retired to Edinburgh in 1769 at age 58. There he could entertain friends such as the great economist Adam Smith or admirers from the colonies like Benjamin Franklin. Hume declared himself to be a supporter of the American colonists in their fight against George III. He insisted that the king had violated the rights that the colonists should enjoy as Englishmen. I am an American in my principles, and wish we would let them alone to govern themselves as they think proper. In 1770, Hume moved into a house in an area called the New Town in Edinburgh. The streets didn't yet have names. Since Hume's house was the first on one street, someone dubbed the street St. David's. The street has that same name to this day. In 1775, at the age of 64, he was stricken with the same disease from which his mother had died. A year later, he commented on his condition. I was struck with a disorder in my bowels, which at first gave me no alarm, but has since, as I apprehended it, become mortal and incurable. I now reckon upon a speedy dissolution. I have suffered very little pain. I possess the same ardor as ever in study and the same gaiety in company. I consider besides that a man of 65 by dying cuts off only a few years of infirmities and though I see many symptoms of my literary reputations breaking out at last with additional luster, I know that I had but few years to enjoy it. It is difficult to be more detached from life than I am at present. Hume was asked by Thomas Boswell, the famous biographer of the renowned Dr. Samuel Johnson, whether he was concerned about the afterlife. 
Hume replied that he was no more worried about his afterlife than his life before he was born. Hume died in 1776 of intestinal cancer, leaving instructions for the posthumous publication of his book entitled Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion. This is the end of Part 1. Please download Part 2 to continue.